you've studied is how much of it is translated into your actions and your behavior, right? Pujugude was also asked once, how do you make a study class interesting? And Pujugude's reply was, he said, take a paper and a pen, and then he paused, and then he said, bring dancers and musicians. Then everybody looked puzzled, dancers and musicians, and then he turned around and said, well, for a study class, everybody needs to study. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I will pass on to Swaminiji. <laughs> Um, I believe a lot of questions have already been submitted to Swaminiji from study group members. Yeah. And uh, at the end, if there is any time, then maybe we can open it up to open the it floor. Up. Mm. How do you? Does this lighting work? You all can see me? In the video, it looks like the sari is more lit up than I am. <laughs> Can you see the face? <laughs> okay, so I think Sri Priya has received the questions and she'll read them out. Are there any simple techniques to shake off dharmasic tendencies and become more energetic? Mm. Well, as study group members, you'll already know, the only way out of tamas is rajas. Um, and so, a regular exercise routine really helps. Because that just gets you into rajas. Right, it's just, you get used to movement. And then, but when we're not moving, tamas becomes very easy. So I know it, it, it sounds like it's unrelated, but it's very related. A regular exercise routine is incredibly important for the way the mind works, and it helps us to stay healthy, not only in body, but much more so in our mind. And so just regular movement in the day already shakes tamas. The minute you've shaken tamas, then all these things, like procrastinating and generally whatever we do, which is tamasic, gets a little bit less. But also, why are you procrastinating? So procrastinating, two reasons. One, I'm lazy, and two, I don't like it. And so then it needs to be dealt with just slightly differently. When I don't like it, then it's not just dealing with procrastination. It's dealing with overcoming likes and dislikes. And it's dealing with, you know, just vasana tendencies. Um, and then reasoning, always. In Vedanta, we know that the way to do things is you talk to yourself. Um, and we probably don't use this enough. Like, we're talking to ourselves all the time. We're all very familiar with our inner voice. But our inner voice may not be as directive because usually we just let our inner voice say whatever our inner voice is saying. But since we have one, we should use it and tell ourselves things. Like, we can lecture ourselves. <laughs> we can inspire ourselves. We can remind ourselves. And so to very deliberately talk ourselves into doing things. Yeah. Sometimes even we have to bribe ourselves into doing things. Yeah. Depending, depending on what it is, why we are procrastinating. Sometimes we're procrastinating, like I said, because we don't like it. Sometimes it's unpleasant and it's painful. Yeah. Like it's some conversations, some people tire us immensely, and then we procrastinate, procrastinate. So bribe yourself into doing it. I'll do it, and then I'll have a hot chocolate. 
I don't know. So depending on what it is, we tackle it depending on what it is. But the two main important things is introduce Rajas into your life. And you, with specific tasks, we may not be able to introduce Rajas into that task. So just introduce Rajas into your life, movement. And secondly, use our inner voice to talk to ourselves, reason to ourselves, bribe ourselves, inspire ourselves. So there's not a question as such, but um, I think around guilt and how to stand up for oneself. So how to deal with guilt and stand up for oneself. Again, sometimes when I don't have context, I'm not quite sure if I'm answering the question. But guilt is the most useless emotion we have. In fact, most emotions serve a purpose. Fear is to keep us safe. Anger is to fight for justice. <clears throat> Excitement is to propel us into action to do things. And sadness is to be able to adjust to lost. Emotions have a purpose. Guilt, not really. Guilt is to alert us that we've done something wrong. After we've been alerted that we've done something wrong, act. Apologize, rectify, penance. To just keep feeling guilty is very useless. Um, again, I'm, I don't know context, but I'm just talking about the emotion as a whole. And then how to stand up for ourselves. So firstly, is it standing up for ourselves? Are we really being persecuted? Or is it that I just don't like doing something? Um, very often life brings us situations, people, circumstances, so that we can grow. Of course, when it's hard, uh, it's easy to blame the other person for making us feel a certain way. But is it really them making us feel this way? Possible. Possible that they are extremely unfair and it's very, and you do need to. And maybe that's the lesson you need to learn to stand up for yourself. But before, before I will say how to stand up for yourself, I will ask, are you really being wronged? Yeah. Because we're very quick to jump to think we're being wronged. Um, if we are really being wronged, Again, context of, is it a physical thing? In which case, actions need to be taken to adjust. Maybe money distribution. Um, or uh, space and noise control. Like, if it's a physical thing, then action needs to be done. Um, Often it's emotional. Um, then maybe a conversation needs to be had. Then maybe they're not listening. But have we tried saying it in different ways? Um, sometimes when we want to have a conversation with someone we find difficult, we go in there with a tone that's very accusing. The minute somebody hears something accusing, they go defensive and then it becomes an argument. And so then we say they don't listening, but it's not that they not listening, it's I went in there accusing. And so like I said, questions like these become very hard to answer without context. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> mm. How do you truly know what divine will is? Define? Divine will. Divine will. Uh, 
Divine will will always have love for everyone in the situation. Mm. Divine will will be Shreyas. You all are familiar with this word. Study group members would have encountered it many times. Shreyas means higher good. Shreyas also means everyone's good. It's not just my good. It has to be everyone's good. And higher. Higher good. So, sometimes if we're not sure and follow, you think it's divine will, I'm not sure, follow. And if it's not divine will, you'll get stopped. Are these too short? But I answered. <laughs> Guruji always says, I'll answer to my satisfaction. <laughs> if the person who asked the question wants more clarification, you're welcome to jump in and further ask the question. After. Oh, yeah, after. Yeah. The next question, Swamiji. Work-life balance from a spiritual perspective. How to achieve it? How to achieve work-life balance. I, um, um, I don't know, because I only work. I don't have life outside of work. <laughs> um, but, um, what shall I totally scandalize London? Cello, let's totally scandalize London. Please stand. And stand on your toes. What happened? Yes, down. <laughs> what happened? <clears throat> Were you balanced? Well, nobody fell. So you were balanced. But you had to concentrate. It wasn't comfortable. You people are missing the point. <laughs> it took effort, very good. What else? Huh? It was fun. No other Swami made you stand on your toes. Did you wobble? Is that what kept you from falling? How come you all didn't answer that? <laughs> Finding balance means constant adjustment. Finding balance doesn't mean eight hours work, eight hours play. That's not balance. Sometimes it's four hours play. Sometimes it's more. It's not, that's not balance. Balance is not falling. Constant adjustments. Balance is looking where the weight needs to be placed 
and place it. I remember hearing this one, uh, she was a, a wife talking about relationships. So she was talking about her relationship with her husband. And she said they do this thing where they check in with each other. Not that each person brings 50% to the relationship. In the morning they'll check in or at the end of the day they check in with each other. And so she'll say something like, today I'm at 10%. All I can give you today is 10%. And then sometimes the husband will say, that's okay, I got it. I can do the 90. <laughs> and some days he'll say, I think I'm barely at 30. <laughs> and then they just leave each other be. Yeah. Balance is not matching. Balance is filling in where the need is. So when you were standing on your toe, shall we do it one more time and notice how this happens? Stand on your toe and notice how you keep adjusting. Notice what you're thinking, notice what makes you do the adjusting. If it gets sore, take a break and then start again. But stay long enough for you to observe what you are doing. Okay, what did you notice? Yes. Core strength. Core strength. <laughs> you people missed the point. <laughs> lift, lift, lift thinking. Huh? You were more focused this time and that it, you made you more steady because you knew what to focus on. When you know what to focus on, you're more stable. Right. And you're doing it very naturally. Very good. You're constantly calculating. But you do need strength. Yes. You're constantly changing. Very good. How to balance? It's constantly changing. Filling in the need where the need is. We all go through various circumstances, situations, challenges in life, whether a relationship, career, financial, or health conditions. These memories block our memory lane often, replaying the bygones. How do we train the mind to forego, forgive, and forget, to proceed in the spiritual journey with sanity and clarity? So you already know the answer. The answer is forgiveness. Sometimes people will say, I've forgiven, but I haven't forgotten. But if it's still upsetting you, you haven't forgiven. And forgiveness is an interesting thing. When we forgive, it's not 100%. Forgiveness happens in layers. So, I'm hurt. The person who's hurt me, I think about it and I think, I forgive you. Sometimes I say it, sometimes I don't say it, and I might not say it to them, actually usually not even needed to say it to them. <clears throat> In my mind, I forgive. And when I say that, usually the first time I say I forgive, I'm only forgiving somewhere between 5 and 10%. So I have forgiven. Let's be generous, 10%, which means 90% I still haven't forgiven. <clears throat> then I continue being hurt, I continue venting, I continue to avoid, I continue to complain, 
And then at some point I think, no, no, I need to let all of this go. I forgive. I let it go. Now it could be another 10%. It could be 40%. Depending on how ready you are to actually let it go. But you still haven't completely forgiven. So let's say you really did a big leap and you've forgiven 40% now. You forgave 10% earlier. You're giving, you forgave 40% now. You still haven't forgiven 50%. And so you have to go through the whole thing again of why I'm forgiving. It's better for me to forgive. I need to set myself free. Forgiving doesn't get, give them a reason to do it again. Whatever it is that I am thinking that's stopping me from forgiving, I need to work through that. And then yet again, I forgive. How much? Depends. Sometimes only 5%. Sometimes the rest. So when I say I'm forgiving, how much? Because when we've completely forgiven, the thought doesn't occur to us and this question won't be there. How to forgive? It's very, very interesting. One the most important, to remind myself that I'm forgiving for my freedom, not for their freedom. But also, we have to know what we're forgiving. Yeah. So very often we'll say, I forgive you for rejecting me. I forgive you for betraying me. I forgive you for... And it will be about the event but actually we have to be very clear on what is the pain I am feeling. So let's say somebody cheats on me or rejects me. What's the pain? And the pain is, I feel I am not loved. Or I feel I am not lovable. Or I feel now I'll never get the love that I wanted. And so what am I forgiving you for? Making me feel unloved. Making me feel like I can't be loved. Whatever it was. I have to be very clear on what it is that the pain is. And I'm forgiving you for that. But when the minute I do that, I already start to realize that's not you. That's me that chose to feel this way in response to what you did. What you did might be really horrendous and horrible and you are truly a horrible person, but that doesn't matter. It's me that came up with this feeling of I am weak, I am unworthy, I am whatever it is that the pain is. And so when we identify what the pain is, and we're forgiving for making us feel this way, then forgiveness goes deeper. Otherwise, when we're forgiving an action, it doesn't go as deep. Identify your pain. Understand clearly what is the pain. And then understand very clearly how that can't be true. So if I feel I am unlovable, it can't be true. It just can't. Absolutely everyone is loved. Maybe we don't value the ones that love us. <laughs> but we loved. <laughs> so this pain that I'm holding on to, which is a thought, isn't true. And then I'm letting go of the thought because I understand it's not true. And I'm also letting go of the pain by forgiving you for creating that pain in me. But forgiveness is a very big topic. I've actually done three full talks on forgiveness, which is there on the podcast. 
if you want to listen to it in more detail. Mind is the cause of bondage and liberation, but it's a huge storehouse of memories from birth to death, both, both positive and negative. How to train the mind to eradicate the past traumas, memories, and negative emotions? I pretty much covered that. Yeah. Could Swamiji say something about Brahmanu Chintanam and actual Dhyanam? Is there a difference between these? It depends how they are used. Yeah. Depending on how they use, they can mean the same thing. Dhyanam usually translates to meditation, can also get translated to contemplation. Brahma chintanam, chintanam means to think, which is contemplation. But contemplation, for those of you who were attending the Upanishad, becomes meditation. So depending on how they use, yes, there's a slight difference. So in the truest sense, what is meditation? In the truest sense, meditation is holding the mind in, well, you can say stillness, but when we have a thought, thought is consciousness plus object. Meditation is to be able to hold the mind in consciousness and have no object. That's very, very difficult. <clears throat> More likely, there's going to be thoughts coming and going. And then I deliberately think thoughts that uplift the mind, that are sattvic, that are based on the scriptures, so that the mantras really reveal themselves to me, then that can be considered chintanam, can also be considered dhyana. Whoever asked this question, is this clear? Do you need more clarification? Is that okay? Could Swamiji explain the difference between seva and karma yoga? Are they the same? If not, which one is superior from, transactional, from the transactional and spiritual point of view? Karma yoga is a bigger umbrella. Seva is included in karma yoga. But even actions done in terms of our career at work can also be karma yoga can also be done in the spirit of seva, even though I'm receiving a paycheck for doing it. Um, so <clears throat> karma yoga is also once the action is done, no matter how flawed it is, I then surrender it. So karma yoga is a bigger umbrella, giving up the fruits of our action after the action is done, do your best, leave the rest, whatever the action, it was very selfish, I did the action to the best of my capacity, I left the fruit, it's still karma yoga. Seva is more the sense of for someone else, for a greater good. So selfish actions can still come under karma yoga. But seva is, even though it's benefiting me, the intention is for it to benefit someone else. Which one's better? The one you are able to do. Whatever you are able to do, do. That's it. <laughs> Ask. Yeah, you had a question. The presence of the divine. We give her the mic, should we? Pray?
when we were talking about the divine will i just wanted to ask you so sometimes i feel um when i want to when i want to ask question to the god or surrender and take my decision sometimes i get palpitations in a certain decision and calmness in the other it may seem not right with the logistics of what's happening around so is that divine will that i should go and at that time i kind of choose what's giving me the calm and peace and not the palpitations no that's not divine will okay so divine will can give palpitations okay so this is what i wanted to clarify because mm. because yes although i yeah okay please explain i won't say anything greater good which one was greater good whatever gives me greater good can give palpitations sometimes greater good means go apologize no no but that's the greater good greater good scary comfort zones easy no growth happens when it's easy if you have a fitness coach yoga instructor and if they tell you do 10 sit-ups and you say easy what do they do make you do 30 cuz 10 is easy <laughs> again questions like this are vague i don't have context yeah switch off Hariyom um us on the question related to forgiveness are some actions unforgivable but uh, if there so if 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 there's a case where extreme in quite an extreme circumstance like harm was done to somebody that was quite severe and the other person was clearly particularly at fault like you know just not horrible or something how do you deal with forgiving something that was clearly um you know something quite a big um yeah big action there's quite a few ted talks on forgiveness one ted talk is a young lady who watched a thief enter the house and then murder her mother and brother and got sent to jail but because he was underage did very little jail time and she talks about her journey to forgive him and she talks about why it's so necessary to forgive him and how until she forgave him she never lived in the present moment she was stuck in the living room watching him murder her mother and brother and she couldn't have a life there is no action that cannot be forgiven we not forgiving them because the action wasn't bad we forgiving them so we can move on there's a very famous self help person called louise hay she starts her books with saying she was raped and her journey started with forgiving the person who raped her giving someone who insulted you is hard enough 
But when we talk about forgiveness, it's usually something horrible. Even now, there's two wars going on. You're having to forgive faceless people for taking family away from you, taking home away from you, throwing your life completely into turmoil. There is nothing that cannot be forgiven. Forgiving doesn't make the action okay. It doesn't mean the action wasn't horrendous. It simply means I am now willing to let go of my pain. It's got nothing to do with that person. It's got to do with me letting go of my pain. Anyone else? The uh, answer on the forgiveness, um, is it um, because of your karma that that has happened to you? So there's a reason um, that that person did wrong to you. So firstly, everything is karma, but that doesn't mean you're being punished. For example, <clears throat> let's say I join the gym and I use the bicycle. I don't know if this example is a good one, but go with me. <laughs> and then I didn't adjust the seat problem properly, and after four months of very sincerely, diligently working out, I have knee problems. Is it karma? Yes, because I went on the bicycle and I didn't adjust the seat according to knowing which angle was better for me. Why did I do such a foolish thing? I didn't know. Now I have knee problem. Is it karma? Yes, I did the action, this is the result. What is karma? Action, result. Is this the result? So is it karma? Am I being punished? Am I a bad person? Did I do something horrible in my last life? (laughs) That I have a knee ache. There was someone there. Swamiji, it's following on from the forgiveness. What if it when what if it is, for example, in the cycle um, example that you just gave, the bit to forgive is yourself. You chose to go on that bike. Now Mm. you've got knee problems. I have to forgive my ignorance and me not trying to find out the right way to do it. I have to forgive myself for causing my pain. Correct. 
and hopefully learn <laughs> and not do it again. <laughs> More than punishment, things happen to us so we can grow. I agree. Yes. Hi, um, so you know like with karma yoga as well, you work without expectation. But then like surely you need to have some sort of expectation, some sort of like let's say I'm at work, I want some result for, to me to drive the action. Yeah. So then how do you find the balance between expectation and then like letting go as well of the result? I think you're using expectation to mean desire. Yeah, like a desired result. Mm. Yeah, we will have desire. Uh, the, the, the Gita's not saying we don't desire, it's saying first step of karma yoga is you have desire, you work. You do your very best to be able to get the thing you desire. After your action's over, when now you have no control of what the outcome's going to be, at that point, surrender. And then when the result comes, accept it as prasad. This is what helps us to manage desire and expectation. I want it, I work towards, but the result is seen as prasad. In today's world, we don't have that concept of prasad as much. But traditionally, when we went to temples, you went to ashram, prasad meant you do not complain. It's got less salt, it's too chilly, it's oily, it's cold, it's too much, it's too, not a single word. Zip. Mm. And it doesn't mean only you don't complain with your mouth. You don't complain here in your head because it's prasad. Mm. It's given to me as what I am meant to get. Mm. Second, prasad is never wasted. Third, prasad is always shared. I'll eat and I'll give others as well to eat because it's prasad. Unless everyone's eating and everyone's gotten prasad, then you quietly finish your own. <laughs> so, do some work, get the paycheck. Maybe it wasn't the amount I wanted. I know this happened in Hong Kong a lot in the last year. Companies are really struggling. People had to take pay cuts. It wasn't, it wasn't what I was expecting. It's less than what I was expecting. The economy at the moment is just that bad. And you hold on to the job you little bit make do till things get better. You accept. Yeah. You still share. I got less than what I wanted. You still share. I got less than what I deserve. You still share. So you want. Go ahead and want. 
But once you get, we accept that this was what was best for us. Then you can try again. I didn't get what I wanted, try again, no problem. At that point also, surrender, accept. concept of prasad is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hariyam Swamiji, just following on from the concept of karma, um, I remember in one of your previous lectures you talked about how most of our karma is settled in this lifetime, if I'm correct in remembering that. Um, and I get obviously the example of uh, the, the bicycle and injuring the knee, but in much bigger things in life, people go through really tough financial times or a very difficult marriage or obviously all the stuff that's going on, the suffering and the wars. And if they've just kind of lived normal, innocent lives, how do we reconcile that from a karma perspective? Everything I said about the bicycle example still applies. Just because it was a simple example doesn't mean it doesn't apply. So, horrible marriage. You got married? Action, result. <laughs> simple as that. And I didn't choose. Parents chose for me, or Masi chose for me. You agreed? You did the feras? Action. Result. The, the principle still applies. Do I deserve to suffer so many years from one action? It was, yeah. <laughs> It's the action, right? Like somebody driving on the highway decides to look at their phone. Action. Result? Horrendous sometimes. Please understand the law of karma. There's no punishment here. Action, result. Why am I suffering? You wanted to get married. <laughs> she gave that example, I'm following that example. Okay, why are you suffering? You chose that job. You chose that country. You chose that house. <laughs> I'm not picking on marriage. I'm not. <laughs> Some have amazingly good marriages. <laughs> why? You chose. <laughs> And then you worked, action, result. There's nothing to reconcile. I'm not being punished. Why is my life hard? Welcome. Everybody's life is hard. Absolutely everybody's life is hard. No, mine is harder, okay. Because there's really no point in arguing. <laughs> we just feel ours is harder. Everyone's is hard. And then sometimes, you know, sometimes people are going through such difficulties. You know, sometimes there's a special needs kid, and then you yourself have health problems, and then, you know, then COVID happened, and then something else happened, and this person's smiling. How are you doing? God's grace. <laughs> and you think, but what about your kid? Yeah, it's okay. And your health? Mm, managing. <laughs> and then sometimes your car's gone to the repair and life is so tough. <laughs> it's, it's really a lot of, 
everyone's life is tough. I'm not making less of anyone's problem. What I'm trying to say is, it's not because we're bad people, it's not because we're being punished. It's got nothing to do with what I did in my last life. But my attitude has a lot to do with what I've done in this life and my past life. Because the vasanas of how we respond to things, we are constantly creating. There's one person I work with in Hong Kong, the harder the project, the more excited she gets. And every time a challenge comes up while we're doing the project, she gets so psyched. Let's do this. And she's got so much energy that I get tired. <laughs> She gets, the more challenges comes, the more excited she gets. I'm not saying you have to be like her. I'm just saying nobody's free from problems. And then how each one of us see it. You can't blame karma and want a reason for why our lives are tough. It's just tough. And then get on with it. Oh, hi. Uh, I have one question on Isha Vasya Upanishad. Huh. Uh, in Isha Vasya Upanishad, it is recommended that one should do the upasana of both manifest as well as the unmanifest. Otherwise, you fall in the darkness, they are saying. So, do you have any suggestions on how to do the upasana of both? So, even though you're doing the upasana of both, it need not be simultaneous. You might have to start with the upasana of manifest and a form until the mind is subtle enough to do upasana of formless. But if mind is already subtle and can do upasana of formless and do mananam and chintanam, even then we can still have a form. When we close our eyes, we start with imagining Ishta Devata, doing salutations to Ishta Devata, maybe chanting for five, ten minutes to settle the mind. And then once the mind is settled, I contemplate on the Upanishad verses, where there's no specific form, but just understanding the Gyan. So it could be sequential. I'm not doing it one phase of my life I'm doing this, one phase of my life I'm doing this, or it can be even just within one sitting. I think we need more lights on the stage and not all on me. It works. Are you on? Hey, yeah. Two weeks have two weeks have flown by. Yeah. And Swamiji has had a variety of programs catering to all age groups, non-stop. You must be exhausted. This trip was better than last. <laughs> <laughs> I had toilet breaks this trip. Um, London's improving. <laughs> I know tomorrow there will be a lot of tears when Swamiji leaves. Where shall he? Um, but Swamiji, I think you've touched the lives of many, in a way which is inexplicable and uh, transformative. And that's happened across all age groups, all genders, all ethnic backgrounds. And that's something special. I think you've also lit, you've illumined the path 
and the, the spiritual path uh, for many of us. Um, and you've nourished our journey with, uh, with love, kindness, and humility. So on behalf of the whole CM family here, our deepest gratitude. We look forward to your visit. Not sure when. Hopefully next year, we will do something bigger. Hopefully across the UK and maybe Europe at large. Just when I thought you were giving me more breaks. <laughs> Pranams, Haryom. Haryom, Haryom. Swami Swarupan and the love is coming here to London. I can totally understand why. You're all so beautifully sincere and working so well together. <laughs> also, I was thinking, no more, but when I was younger, you know all the fancy brands would do New York, London, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> like you only, if you were in New York, London, Chin Maya Mission, New York, <laughs> London. <laughs> We up there. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramaya, sarve badrani pashyantu, ma kaschitu kapak bhavet, asatoma sadkamaya, tamasoma jyotirgamaya, Mrityarma Amritam Gamaya Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnamutachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Garbhya Namaha Hari Om